Welcome to the Culture Lab. I'm your host, Aga Bayer. This podcast helps you turn your company culture into rocket fuel for meaningful growth. It gives you the tools and inspiration to make work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging. This is where we explore how to cultivate remarkable cultures, cultures that scale and evolve as our businesses grow and the world keeps on changing. So we first have to actually even figure out why are you hiring for diversity in the first place? I'm also using air quotes when I say for diversity. Like, why are you doing this? Because if you're just bringing people into the workplace, but you haven't created an inclusive workplace culture, then what happens is those folks leave. What is even more you know, pervasive is they leave and then the leaders, the team leaders say, the hiring managers say, well, see, I told you they couldn't cut it in this environment. And it's like, no, actually what it is, is they can do the work. They just don't want to work with you because your environment is toxic and you're treating them in a way they realize like I can be treated better elsewhere. So they leave. So then you get into this vicious cycle. Hi, friends. Welcome to episode 129 of the Culture Lab podcast. This episode is brought to you by Culture Brain, a -a one-of-a-kind accelerator program where culture leaders get hands-on support and guidance on how to reach their goals faster, especially now in this brave new world of remote and hybrid work. Culture Brain connects you with outstanding peers on the same journey, but also with world-class experts, including people you know from the show. And they all help you identify and implement new, better ways of creating a culture where people do their best work. Check it out at tinyurl.com forward slash culturebrained. And no need to write it down. There's a link in the show notes. Today, we're talking bias with Stacey Gordon, an extraordinary leader and thinker in the space. Her book on bias is an amazing tool for anyone looking to understand and challenge workplace biases. But before we dive in, I want to peel back the curtain just a little bit on the making of this episode. So the backdrop to this recording was personally challenging for me. It took place just a month after I lost my mom to cancer and right on the eve of my husband's major surgery. So to say that I was not at my best would be putting it mildly. Stacey, of course, was brilliant, as you will hear in a moment. But after the interview, I was convinced I hadn't done justice to Stacey's message. So I reach out to my team and I say, hey, I have really bad news. I think I effed up this interview. I think I dominated the conversation. My comments were disjointed. I was not in the moment. So, I mean, can you check if it's salvageable? And so they listen to the interview and then they tell me, they think it's great. And I'm still skeptical. And so I listen to the beginning of our conversation. And to my surprise, I find out that I didn't get into Stacey's way as much as I thought I did. Why am I sharing this? I'm sharing this because I know that it's a common internal struggle many of us face. This critical voice in our heads that amplifies our insecurities, especially in times of vulnerability. We really are our worst critics. So as you listen to this episode, just remember that we all have moments of self-doubt. And I think what's important to have is the ability to challenge these thoughts and find strength in our shared human experiences. Now, let's hear what the amazing Stacey Gordon has to teach us about creating more inclusive and unbiased workplaces. Hi, I'm Stacey Gordon, and I am a workplace culture consultant based in Los Angeles. And I have been in the DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, profession for about a decade at this point. And I'm excited to be here. I am so excited to have you with us, Stacey. Thank you so very much for accepting the invitation. Welcome to the Culture Lab. Thank you. The first question that I have for you is actually the question that I ask all of our guests. And it's about the early cultural influences that shaped you as a person. How did you grow up and what impact did it have on you? 
I'm excited to answer this question because so I grew up, I was actually born in London, lived there for the first 11, 12 years of my life. And then my parents uh, moved to Brooklyn, New York. So you can imagine growing up as a, a black person in England in the 80s <laughs> and then moving to Brooklyn in the 90s as a black person with a British accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not an ideal scenario. <laughs> what was it like? <laughs> it's very interesting. I think I, I learned a lot. And I think that's why I'm so adaptable, because, you know, I really had to adapt. And when I moved to Brooklyn, it, it was, you know, luckily, it was a British accent, which everyone loves a British accent, right? It's so it was cutesy. And everyone was like, Oh, speak to me, say things. But then you got to a point where as I got to high school, it was like, if you don't really understand the culture, it could actually get you killed, <laughs> right? And so I really had to adapt very quickly to a completely new culture, especially from the outside. People look at me and assume that I automatically know the culture because I'm Black. But then I would open my mouth and they'd be like, who, what? They just didn't know what to do with me. <laughs> So it was a, a very, it was a time of a lot of learning, let's say. Yeah, I can only, I can only imagine. And looking back on it now, I tell, still tell my parents, I go, what were you thinking? <laughs> you know, to take, and especially Brooklyn in the 90s was a, a really rough time, right? A uh, lot of drugs, a lot of crime, a lot of violence. And I got dropped right in the middle of that. So and I do credit, you know, my tough exterior was born out of that time. It also helped me to see things. It allowed me to go into spaces that probably I wouldn't normally be allowed to go into. Because again, as long as you keep your mouth shut, everyone just assumes you belong, right? And it's not till you open up your mouth and start speaking that they go, wait, imposter. Yes. Yes, and your accent gives you away, or the way you look gives you away. That's why I said not an ideal scenario, because these situations when we are super young and we stand out, either because we look differently and we don't blend in or we sound different, they're really tough, especially on kids. I'm someone who has lived abroad for a huge chunk of my life, and I also see my friends' kids and how they struggle. A lot of my friends are expats and they move around quite a bit, and it really is a challenge, especially for kids. And I know, Stacey, that you get asked this a lot, even today. I can only imagine that back then, perhaps even more frequently. And I do too, because of my accent. I now live in Greece. I'm blonde and white, and I don't look Greek. And so people will ask me this question as well. It's seemingly innocuous, but, but when you hear, where are you from? How does it make you feel? Every time I, I have to pause and I go, Ugh, okay, what? And I, I just, now I, I ask, I go, well, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, what do you want to know? And I think for people who have grown up in one area, lived in one area, they don't truly understand. They're like, what are you talking about? It's a simple question. Just answer the question. Uh, but it's not that simple because, again, depending upon the context and where you are, it's like, well, why do you want to know? Even asking where are you from gives the connotation that you understand I'm not from here. I'm not one of you. And you want to know, you want to be able to pinpoint what the difference is, <laughs> right? So that you can, you know, do whatever it is you're going to do with that information. And, and I get it. Sometimes it's not that deep. Sometimes it really is just you're at a networking event and people are like, oh, so where are you from? Because everyone has come in from different areas, right? And sometimes I have to remember that. I'm like, I'm at a conference where people have come in from different parts of the United States, different parts of the world. And the where are you from? usually in that context just means where did you fly from <laughs> that morning, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? When it's not so deep as like, where were you born? Where did you grow up? <laughs> but it's very triggering because of just the, the background on that. And so I usually will have to ask people, do you mean where did I come from today? <laughs> where do I live now? Where was I born? Where did I grow up? Like, which from do you want? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Because there are so many froms and your story, I think, is a story that reflects more and more individuals now. People move around and they come from diverse backgrounds. And answering this question, 
becomes more and more difficult. And as you say, it also really has this assumption sometimes, and, and I suppose it's not always the case, but sometimes it does have this assumption that you've mentioned that you're, you're different. You're not from around here and I need to put you in a box and understand, you know, what, what's the label that I need to put on this box. So, you know, thinking about your journey as a kid growing up in London and then suddenly moving to Brooklyn and completely uprooting your life, being thrown into this new environment that, as you've mentioned, was challenging. I can already see why you would end up doing what you are doing today. But I'm also curious because it's an easy assumption to make. Was there something else? Was there a catalyst that made you decide to focus your work and your expertise on creating equitable, inclusive workplaces? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I've I've always done this work, some aspect of it, no matter what I was doing in every role, every job I've ever had. But formally, what happened for me was I was actually working as a recruiter, just being privy to the biases that, you know, hiring managers had when it came to women, to professionals of color. Um, And I just, I noticed, I was like, oh, it's so much easier for me to get the white guy hired, right? Get them hired, I get paid. It's great. I've got a woman or heaven forbid, a person with an accent. It was an issue and it would take longer. And really the catalyst for me was I had a, a gentleman who you know, we'd gotten him an offer. He was supposed to get hired. They said, oh, we're going to send you the offer over in 24 hours. And it never came. And it took three additional weeks of me fighting for this candidate to get hired. And I thought to myself, wow, if I was somebody else who didn't care about this black guy getting this job, I would have just said, forget it. Let me go find somebody else who is more acceptable. (laughs) And that guy wouldn't have gotten the job so that I could get paid faster, right? Because if I'm working on contingency, I only get paid when the person gets hired. So the fact that I have to wait an additional three weeks and do all this extra work to get somebody hired after the CEO has said, oh, no, we want to hire this person. We're sending you an offer letter made me realize, I was like, wow, I can just imagine the number of people that this has happened to over time. And this is problematic, right? So that's really what drove me to say, no, we've got to do something about this. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible. And it kind of takes my thinking in the direction of thinking about inclusion, because once you realize how difficult it is for certain individuals with certain backgrounds to be included, starting from hiring to what their experience eventually is at work. There's no going back. It, there is no unseeing once you realize what's happening. And I think that for a lot of organizations, the first moment they realized, yes, the system is broken and we really need to change that was the moment that led a lot of organizations to saying, right, we need to do something about this. And so we're going to start uh, by creating more diversity in our workplace. And theoretically, uh, it would be easier to get hired if you belong to an underrepresented community, for example. But first of all, practically, and I think your experience was testament to that I don't think that the situation has changed dramatically since then. It's not always easier, but also it's really interesting what happens once the so-called, and I'm doing air quotes now, diverse candidates are getting hired into some organizations. This is a long-winded way of asking you, first of all, how do you define real inclusion in the workplace? What is it? Let's start with a good definition. Yeah, I think even before we start with the definition, I have to address the, the idea, right? There is this pervasive view that because we are focusing on diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging in the workplace, that somehow that means that underrepresented minorities, it's easier for them to get a job. And we know that that is absolute BS, right? I don't know how much cursing we allow on this show, so I'll (laughs) mind my mouth. You know, there's just some things that make you want to throttle people, that they actually believe that somehow it is easier for a a woman to get a job because there's a, a, a gender initiative going on. Like you wouldn't need a gender initiative if it was easier for them to get a job. We have to create a whole entire program and basically force you to see the value in in somebody. And I gotta say, as a black person and as a woman, the fact that I my literal job 
is to work to get other people to see my value is problematic AF, <laughs> right? Like this is something that we should just, it should just happen. So the fact that even this whole initiative exists should help people to understand that it absolutely is not easier for a person of color or for a woman to get a job, no matter what initiatives you've got going on in your organization. Because if it was, we wouldn't need them in the first place, right? Yeah, this is such an important point to make, right? Because I think there is, there is that assumption that it is going to be easier because there's so much focus on the metrics and the data-driven approaches that basically look at, you know, what's the split? How, how many women? How many people of color? How many neurodiverse people we have? But we know that Unfortunately, it's not really translating itself into a reality for a lot of people. And thank you for underscoring that. And when you go basically through the ringer to get a job and you get it, what happens then? What are the experiences of people? Because I think you have, due to your work, a front row seat to what's happening in organizations. What's the reality that people are being faced with very often after they get a job? you know, to answer your question about what, like, what is inclusion? You know, we've got diversity, equity, inclusion. I think diversity is the mix of people, right? But inclusion is the act of valuing those individuals in your workplace. We also have to remember that inclusion is an action. It isn't something we talk about. So if you aren't actively including people in your workplace, right, then you're not being inclusive. It's not about something we just talk about. It is an actual action. It's an activity. When we get to hiring for diversity, uh, because I swear if I had a nickel for every time someone says, we want to increase the diversity of our talent pipeline, I wouldn't be talking to you right now. I'd be sipping a martini on the beach somewhere (laughs) because I'd be a very rich woman. (laughs) I hope it happens one day, (laughs) Stacey. (laughs) And maybe I can join you. (laughs) But it's like if we're focusing on diversity only, then we've missed the point because what we're doing is we are looking at, okay, we don't have enough of whatever, fill in the blank, right? And usually that isn't based in any kind of real goal. So we first have to actually even figure out why are you hiring for diversity in the first place? I'm also using air quotes when I say for diversity, like, why are you doing this? Because if you're just bringing people into the workplace, but you haven't created an inclusive workplace culture, then what happens is those folks leave. What is even more you know, pervasive is they leave and then the leaders, the team leaders say, the hiring managers say, well, see, I told you they couldn't cut it in this environment. And it's like, no, actually what it is, is they can do the work. They just don't want to work with you because your environment is toxic and you're treating them in a way they realize like I can be treated better elsewhere. So they leave. So then you get into this vicious cycle well, we hired the woman and she didn't stay. So I told you it wouldn't work out. So now we're not hiring a woman. And right, we, we continue in this, this vicious cycle. I'm really curious whether you have seen effective ways of breaking the cycle, because I've seen the cycle playing out in reality so many times. And what has been shocking to me that I've seen it happen in organizations that I thought we're genuinely committed to creating a thriving environment for everyone and that has genuinely good intentions when it comes to creating a workplace where everyone can thrive. And then after making quite a number of hires of extremely talented individuals that happened to be part of underrepresented communities, after a few months, these individuals told me, this is a toxic workplace and I don't want to work here. And so, A, I'm assuming there is a blind spot in a lot of organizations and you've alluded to it already. Like you said, you, you re- reinforce basically that belief that these people are simply not able to succeed. So A, there is a blind spot or B, I'm assuming also, even if something comes to the awareness of leaders in those organizations, they are unable to take the right actions to correct what's wrong. So what's going on and how can you address problems like that, Stacey, when you realize that great talent is leaving your organization because they find the environment toxic? 
like, so it's a number of things happening all at once. And so again, we look for a, a solution to problem A, and we might find that solution. The problem is we've got problem A, B, C, D, and E, and they're all converging together. And so you solve for one problem, not realizing that all of these things all have to be fixed and addressed simultaneously. And so that's part of the problem, I think, is that culture is a mix of, you know, as you said, we we might have an organization that has a good reputation, but then you're surprised about people leaving. Well, you have to look at where are they leaving from, right? Is it a team? Is it a hiring manager? Is it a department? Is it a function? What in there is causing these issues? So I used to work for a company many, many years ago. I worked in the legal department and our department was fine, right? It wasn't really toxic or anything. It was just okay. But then when you look at the different environments within that organization, we operated one way. But you'd go to the marketing department and they were on a different floor and they operated completely differently. The way the offices were set up, how people spoke to each other, you know, the, the, everything was just night and day, very different. And then you'd go to the, the IT department. And again, very different, completely different department. I always said, oh, I never want to work here. It's so dark in here. Everyone's just sitting hunched over their computers. You know, it was a like completely different environment. No one talked to each other. So you can't look at an organization as a whole and say, that organization has gotten it right. You have to look at the people and you've got to drill down because in every organization, there are departments that are thriving and doing really well. And there are teams that are toxic and awful and, <laughs> and that filters in, right? And so overall, especially when we do these um, Employee engagement surveys, we do it company-wide, and then we take all that information and we aggregate it. But do we really look like department by department to see what that looks like, team by team? Because if you did that and you really drilled down, you would start to identify where the problems are. But we don't get that specific. Or sometimes we do, but then somehow the buck stops at that level. So it seems like Basically, this person is familiarized with the data. They know that the leader, for example, of a department, they know that they have some issues, but they are not being supported in taking action. And very often, especially in case of people who have created toxic cultures, it's obvious, I think, to me that they probably would have done something different if they knew better. So they need support and they need some guidance in how to resolve all these issues and probably first really needs to look deep down inside and and self-reflect. Is this your experience as well, that leaders are not getting the support and the nudge to change something when they realize that they are the problem? They first have to realize they're the problem, right? And so for most leaders who are the problem, they don't realize that. So there is a a twofold, right? There's, There's the side of there are individuals who or leaders who say, yeah, I know that we can do better and I want to do better, but they don't know how. And especially in this environment that we're in right now, People are very divisive. It's difficult to have conversations and actually pose questions and have discussions without, you know, sides being drawn and people having, you know, issues about that, right? So just communicating right now is very difficult. It's also, we're a very, I won't speak for the entire world, but I'll say in the United States, right? We have a very toxic leadership environment, which is that if you are a leader, you should know everything, right? You should have all the answers. So most leaders aren't going to say, hey, actually, I don't know. But most leaders don't know. And I think so it's just even changing the narrative about what leadership means. Because if we are really thinking about this, we shouldn't be expecting leaders to have the answer. We should be expecting leaders to help identify the answer, right? And that means, or it's even posing the right question and then letting their team find the answer, right? That's what leadership should be. But we have been very taught that leaders are supposed to have the answer, make the decision, and just go with it. 
when nine times out of 10, these leaders have not been given any kind of management training. They don't have any kind of leadership development. They have no idea what they're doing. They were really good at their job as an individual contributor and got promoted. Just because you're really good at sales doesn't make you a great sales manager. And when you haven't given people support, as you said, or training or development or any of that, and you put them into a position where they are told that they're not supposed to say they don't know, we've created this recipe for disaster. But on top of that, we know we have people who have been in, I think, in roles where we can see they are not doing well, they are dysfunctional, and the leaders themselves have not taken a stand and said, you know what, this is not acceptable, we need to fix this. They've said, oh, well, you know, that's just John, you know, that's just how he operates, but he's, he's you know, it's, it's good enough. Yeah, exactly. I think one important piece is accountability, because obviously support and nudging people to make a change are important. But I feel like there is not enough accountability when it comes to, you know, what are you going to do with the information that you have just received? Because typically what will happen is the department will receive their engagement survey or culture survey results and Some issues are evident, but I very rarely see a process in place where the leaders would be asked to come up with an action plan and reach out for help to actually address these issues. And this is particularly evident the higher you go in the hierarchy, which is a bit ironic because we often talk about, right, this disproportionate impact that senior leaders have on on organizations and how big of a shadow they cast. And, And then at the same time, they are the people who, in my experience, and I might be wrong, and please, our listeners, if you have examples, that prove that this is completely wrong. I'm, I'm really open to it. But in my experience, it's often that these are the people, the people who are at the top are the least willing to say, I don't know. I need some help here. I know that I have a problem because obviously my people are telling me, but I don't know how to resolve it. So I need your help. I need some ideas. I need some further guidance around that. Well, not just that they're not willing to say they don't know, but they're also willing to say, I do know I have the solution and you better all follow me. Right. (laughs) Even when they're absolutely wrong. So if we think about, you know, right now we're going through this withdrawal from, you know, pandemic withdrawal, right? And we've got all these headlines saying 90% of CEOs say that all of their employees will be back to the office by the end of 2024, beginning of 2025 or whatever numbers they keep throwing out now, right? (laughs) And I'm just like, have we learned nothing? <laughs> I don't even have words sometimes. <laughs> Every time I see this, I think well, your employees are literally telling you, we don't want this. You've allowed employees to leave, to relocate, to put their kids into different schools, to you know live in an environment where they can have a better work-life balance. And then you turn around and go, yeah, we changed our mind. Get your butt back to the office. <laughs> I don't understand how any leader worth their salt can actually stand up there with a straight face and say these things. I know. It's crazy. I've read this research too, and apparently it's 75% of CEOs who say that by, by the end of 2025, they are hoping that their entire workforce is going to be back to the office. It's nuts. It, it really is. Many of them are mandating it. You've got CEOs that are threatening to fire individuals who don't come back. You know, it's not just hoping. <laughs> They're out here throwing down the gauntlet. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a great example of how leaders are not listening. And some leaders, there are some leaders that are, but but how unwilling they are to really, you know, use the skill of empathy that we would expect every human being to have, but certainly someone who is managing very often leading organizations of hundreds of thousands of people you'd expect that they would master that skill by the time they reach um, the position of a CEO, but obviously it's not the case. Well, having said that, is there hope, Stacey? (laughs) And 
what are your thoughts on that? Because on one hand, this is the reality that we are faced with. And I know that we've been venting a little bit about what we're seeing in organizations. But on the other hand, I know that you wouldn't be doing the work that you are doing if you didn't believe that there is hope. And I also know that you are doing really impactful work that really brings about positive change. So if you were to share with our listeners, when you are faced with a typical situation, which is perhaps not extreme, so not an extremely toxic environment, but you definitely see potential for improvement when it comes to diversity, when it comes to inclusion, when it comes to equity, when it comes to a sense of belonging in the workplace. What are the important things to keep in mind? And I think particularly, I'd be super interested if you could share things that we rarely talk about when we have these conversations about creating workplaces that work for everyone. That is actually our mission at Rework Work, is to make workplaces work for all. We have to be thinking about all. And I know that in this environment, again, because we're talking about DEI, again, there's this pervasive thought that we're only trying to make workplaces better for women or only for people of color. And uh, sometimes it's thought of to the detriment of others, right? And it's like, that's not the case. The goal is to make it work for all. When you go into an organization and you realize that there are pay equity issues, we don't say, we're only going to make it better for the women. <laughs> Forget the men. <laughs> a rising tide lifts all boats. I think it's really important to understand that, that, that DEI is about workplace culture. We've always looked at it as something that has to work for all. It looks at teams, how teams operate and how are we ensuring, you know, again, you can't go in to an organization and say, we want to fix the entire organization, but you can look at teams and start to work in those spaces because team by team, you can make change. And those teams need psychological safety. For me, psychological safety, it's like the foundation Because when you have psychological safety, what that's going to do is allow people to actually give feedback. It's going to allow people to speak up and tell you what is what is wrong. It means that leaders are listening to what is wrong. They're also listening to potential solutions. Without psychological safety, you can't do any of the workplace culture changes that we want to see because psychological safety has that that basis of creating trust, right? Authenticity and improving communication. We've already had Amy Edmondson and Timothy Clark on the podcast, and they really focus their work on building psychological safety. But I'm always curious to get insights from other guests around what can we do in practical terms to improve psychological safety in teams? Because there's a wide understanding of what psychological safety is among most of people now, they've recognized the the need for it. But I think we still struggle to find practical ways of cultivating that environment. So where would you point people to? What are the things to think about or practices to implement to increase psychological safety in our teams? So again, it's like talking about managers managing and and don't have any professional development or support. These are things that you're going to need some support creating. And so it is, I think, identifying uh, programs, you know, professional development that's going to help. When you look at your team, a very simple thing that we always start with is it's creating a new way of communicating with each other. It's first getting acceptance from everybody, agreement that you even want to do this together. Because starting there, now you're already at least on the same page, right? So to be able to start and say, hey, we want to be a better team. We actually think we could improve the way that we communicate, the way that we collaborate, the way that we work together. And if everybody is on board with that, you know, let's have a conversation about that. And getting everyone to say, yeah, actually, I'd like to find some ways to improve team dynamics. Once you have agreement, that's a great place to start because everybody's on the same page. So now where you go from that, you just it's it's about creating agreement in every step. And it's not that everyone has to be 100 percent on the same page uh, of exactly what you're going to do. But it's creating agreement that 
if we disagree, that we can do that in this space and that it's going to be okay. And that if I disagree, I'm not going to be retaliated against. If I disagree, you're going to hear me out. If I disagree, it's because I have some alternative ideas for how we can, you know, move this project forward. And I just want to be heard. Starting in that space, I think, is is really a great place to, to begin. And it sounds really cheesy, <laughs> but we have a little exercise that we give to teams. And we just say, look, in, in order to kind of start fostering this, we have them do what we call their personal weather report. It basically, you, instead of asking people, because when you ask people, how are you doing today? What do people say? Well, okay, well, fine. Right. Great. Fine. Amazing. Right. <laughs> and does that tell you anything? No, right? It's always what comes out of the mouth. Oh, fine, fine. Even if you woke up that morning and had a fight with your spouse and you're in a really bad mood, even if you got into a car accident that morning and you're late for work, right? You're just like, oh, fine, right? It means nothing. But we have found that with this personal weather report, when you ask people uh, to say how they're feeling in the form of weather, right, it opens up a little bit. You get a chance to finally to understand a little bit of how people are feeling without them having to go into their emotions right? and without having to be too vulnerable. Just seeing the impact of that. I actually did it for a group uh, that I was facilitating a workshop for a couple of years ago. And I always remember this because it was just so astounding. They were doing an all day workshop and I was probably the third workshop speaker, facilitator. I had them do a personal weather report. And one of the individuals said, actually, I'm not doing so great. And just like shut off his his Zoom camera and dropped out of the meeting. And I was like, oh, OK. And he came back 10 minutes later and said, I appreciate you actually kind of doing this. I found out that a, a friend of mine, a really good friend of mine passed away this morning. And so he's like, I really wasn't doing well. And just having somebody ask how I was doing and having to kind of put that into words made me realize that I wasn't doing so great. And it was like he had sat through a couple of other facilitations that morning, right? No one had had any conversations. It was just, we're going to get right into it. We're just going to do work. And so what I think is really important about that is, especially as a team leader, you need to understand how your team is functioning. If you're running a meeting, right? I want to know that if we've got a really important project coming up, that half of you are not doing well, right? Your your weather report is there's thunderstorms, there's like clouds and lightning on the horizon. I'm like, okay, let's regroup. Let's maybe rethink the way that we're doing this. Something isn't working, right? It gives me an indication of how to be a better leader. I really like that. And I think if if I extract principle out of this practice, it's really making small steps in the right direction where people can actually learn that being vulnerable, open about how we feel, et cetera, et cetera, it's okay and it's safe and it's welcome in, in this environment. And then, of course, once you get familiar with that, once you get comfortable with that, you can do bigger things like maybe being vulnerable and trying out something new that you haven't done before or uh, challenging someone's idea or contributing your own idea. But I, I agree that it often starts with really simple and really small things like asking, you know, how are you really? Not, not as we usually do, but with genuine interest in how people are doing. And I know that you've also been an outspoken advocate for the power of storytelling to drive inclusion, which to me is a higher degree, obviously, of vulnerability. And I'd love to hear from you if you could break it down for us, why you feel like stories can do the things that, for example, data-driven approaches to inclusion or diversity can't. You know, stories, I think, again, it's it's that, that, that vulnerability and just the humanity in us. I think you said it earlier, empathy. It is so much easier to have empathy when you hear a story versus data. And so sometimes you can take that data and use it to create a story. But this, the story is what we remember, how that person was feeling, what it, how it impacted them. That makes such a difference. I will say this is one of the reasons that even, you know, going back to this idea of bringing individuals back to the workplace, everyone says, oh, we need to be together so that we can collaborate. 
that's true, right? Collaboration does work well when we're together, but it doesn't mean we have to be in the office together 24-7, right? (laughs) And when you're able to come together and get an idea of just how things affect others, we really have to be empathetic. And I think as a leader, if you cannot find empathy, you really need to rethink your role. Um, You're in the wrong, (laughs) right? You're in the wrong role. Uh, I don't want to go off tangent, but I think the other thing that is really important about leadership in this is that if you aren't contributing positively to the workplace, if you were the cause of attrition, if you were the cause of toxic workplaces, right? And toxic teams. If you are the reason that people wake up in a cold sweat on Monday morning and don't want to come into the office, I feel like you are literally stealing from your organization, right? Because you have a, you're being paid to do a job. And not only are you not doing it, but you are actually being detrimental to the organization. From an accountability standpoint, it is so important to, to, for leaders to really be looking at that. But from the the storytelling standpoint, it makes the data more digestible. It helps us to kind of understand what it is that people are trying to convey. And without it, it, we do have a a more of an uphill battle. And it's difficult for some people, right, to create that story. In our uh, article that we co-wrote, Selena Resvani and I co-wrote an article called, um, I forget the exact title now, but it was about storytelling and a Harvard Business Review. It's that that space of we do have to be a little bit vulnerable. It's not about breaking things down and telling people our deepest, darkest secrets, right? It's not about creating best friends in the workplace. I don't even really have to like you all that much, but I do have to want to be able to collaborate and work with you in this space. And being able to distinguish between that is important. I heard this phrase, I think it's it's attributed to Rumi, and I use it a lot on the show because it seems relevant in so many conversations and relevant to what you have just said, which is understanding is just a different word for love. And I think it's so true that once you understand where someone's coming from or what their story is, as you say, maybe you will not end up liking them, but you will certainly love them. <laughs> I think in the sense of in and in the sense of love in Greek, there are eight different words for love. I know that in English it's quite limiting and sometimes love feels really weird in, in the context of business, but I'm talking about the love that allows you to respect someone and acknowledge their strengths and be interested in what their needs are and what they need to thrive because they're on your team and you are working towards a goal together. And so you are invested in this person. For me, it's love. And when you understand someone, I think you cannot help but love this person and care for this person. So I can see why stories are so incredibly important. And we use stories in our in our methodology as well. And I wonder if we want to be a little bit more practical and help our listeners to incorporate that as a practice in their organization, what would be the process and how do you go about it? So let's say that you want to create a little bit more of an understanding within your team and you want to use stories to drive positive change on your team. You know, how do you start? What do you ask people to do? What's the format? for sharing stories. Can you speak a little bit to that? You know, you said there's eight different words in Greek for love. And and then you said invested. And I think that is probably the word, right, in English (laughs) that leaders can really step into is investing in their people. You know, why would you have people on your team that you don't want to invest in? Or, you know, why would you have people on your team that you don't, that you feel like you have to micromanage? It's like, let people do their jobs, right? Let them flourish. And what do they need to be able to flourish? I think it's a really important question that every leader should have the answer to about every uh, person on their team. And if they don't have that answer, that's a good, great place to start, <laughs> right? Is really getting into a conversation. And so I think, you know, when you talk about storytelling, the one-on-one meetings that managers are having or should be having, because we also know many of them are not having them, but should be having with their direct reports is that place for storytelling, because that's how you start to learn, right, about this individual. 
You want them to tell you their story so you can understand who they are and where they're trying to get to within the organization. How can you invest and pour into them to help them to get there? It really is about asking questions, being authentic in wanting to know the answer, and then utilizing those answers to actually create positive change and positivity, you know, positive communications, positive relationships, positive team dynamics within that, uh, within that team. So underutilized and yeah, I wonder how many managers feel like they have the time on their calendars to have these one-on-ones as often as, as they'd like to, right? So that's a perfect example. You said, do they have the time? How do you not have the time? It's literally part of your job. It is part of your job. If you find yourself as a manager saying, I don't have the time to meet with my direct reports, you're doing your job wrong because that is part of your job. Yeah, 100%. I always say, you know, look at your calendar and you'll see your values, right? Because we often say we value our people. Sure. Let's have a look at your calendar now and see the next week. And let's see how much time you're actually investing in developing your people, in understanding your people, in making sure that you know what they need to thrive, why they have certain preferences, what's the impact for them, and so on and so forth. And suddenly you realize, oh, actually, yeah, not a lot of that happening on my calendar. I want us to shift gears a little bit because I know that at the core of your work, there's something that a lot of us need to be thinking more about, which is unconscious bias. You have one of the most popular LinkedIn learning courses on this topic, and you've also written a wonderful book, Unbias, which is about addressing unconscious bias at work. So let me start by asking you, what is unconscious bias? You know, it it really, down to its core, is just a way for us to categorize other people without thinking. So it's a shortcut. We go from A to Z and we skip all the other letters in the middle, right? We just want to be able to quickly make a snap decision. People, they see me and there's decisions that they're going to make about me immediately, right? You see me and you think female, mother, daughter. Now, daughter makes sense because I had to have been born somewhere, right? But I mean, there's this thing about me that you're immediately going to assume. Um, And some of those things are going to be wrong. You might assume my political affiliation. You might assume my thoughts on whatever, right? There's just certain things that you just assume that you're going to know how I'm going to think about something, what I'm going to say about something, what my opinion might be. And it's also just the assumptions that we make based upon how people are dressed, their accent, and it's because we, we want to, kind of like you said earlier, when we talk about where are people from, we want to be able to put people into boxes really quickly. We're like, which box do you belong in? I don't have time to get, actually get to know you individually. I just want to take you and throw you in a box so I can move about my day. Yeah, and I think evolutionarily, it served the purpose at some point because we need to make quick decisions from time to time. We need to be able to say, this is a lion and this is a friendly puppy. But today, it's not always serving its purpose. And so one assumption, and please correct me if I'm saying something wrong, one assumption that is safe to make is that we all have unconscious bias. And second assumption that I'm making here is we should probably all be challenging our unconscious assumptions. But because they are unconscious, how do we do it? Yes, we definitely do all have bias, right? We all have unconscious bias. Like you said, it's ingrained, but it can be addressed. I like to use the example of breathing. So our breathing is subconscious, right? It just happens. We don't walk around saying, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, right? We're not paying attention to the fact that we're breathing. It's just happening. However, you can hold your breath. If I asked you to, you could then focus and go, oh, yeah, I can hold my breath. And some people can hold their breath longer than others. Some people are trained, military, Navy SEALs, right? They are trained to be able to hold their breath for three minutes, maybe longer in some instances. But the thing is, how do you get from being able to hold your breath for 30 seconds to being able to hold your breath for three minutes? You have to practice. 
So that means you actually have to be very deliberate about noticing your breathing and then about focusing on it. And it's something that you're going to have to do again and again and again until you can get to this uh, goal that you're attempting to reach. And so the same is true for our unconscious biases. We're going to have them. It's going to happen. But every time it does, we have to try to catch it and say, oh, wait a minute. I just said this thing, did this thing, made this assumption about this person. Was that based in fact or did I make that up? And the more that we do it, the more we start to notice where we are making assumptions about people and the things that we're making assumptions about. But it just it's going to take practice and time. And I keep saying practice because that is something, you know, again, we think, oh, we're going to take an unconscious bias training and that somehow that's going to solve, like how, what makes, it's like, (laughs) there's absolutely no way that that's possible. So it's not to say that unconscious bias, you know, development and, and education isn't important. It absolutely is important as an awareness builder. Um, As you mentioned, my unconscious bias course on LinkedIn learning, yeah, it was the number one most watched course of 2021 because after George Floyd's murder and we were sitting in a pandemic, everyone's eyes were opened and there was awareness brought. And so people said, oh, I need to learn more. And it's like, absolutely you do, (laughs) right? But we can't stop there. You can't take this 24 minute course and go, okay, I got it. (laughs) It's a thing that makes you start to question And then say, oh, I probably need to learn more. And then you learn a little bit more and you say, oh, I probably need to learn a little bit more. But not only learn, but practice. So the other thing that we have done is we've actually created our own course called Unconscious Inclusion. And the idea there is to get you from unconscious bias to unconscious inclusion through a pathway. And so it actually has built in practices. So micro learning with like, I'm going to learn about this concept and then I'm going to go practice it in my workplace. And we guide people through that step by step by step for 13 weeks. <laughs> so the, uh, the idea is like, let's create new practices, new habits, new ways of looking at people. And you're not going to do it by just taking one of my courses, I'm not saying don't take them, please do. But <laughs> And you have to practice. If you're not doing the action, we talked about this earlier too, inclusion is an action. So if you aren't actively doing things, you're not growing, you're not learning, you're not going to be changing anything. Yeah. I think it's such an important point that it was stressing and uh, double click here on inclusion is action. Most of us, I think, tend to think of ourselves as good people people with good intentions and stop there. And I personally need to remind myself all the time that it's better to, and I always forget that the woman who has come up with this term, um, being goodish, that I'm goodish, I'm not good. And being goodish means that there is room for improvement. And I'm trying to remind myself that there are better ways of approaching this than I am right now. I couldn't agree more with you that it's a journey. You should never stop, right? And the moment you consider that you are done with this is the moment that you stop the work, basically, and then you start kind of deteriorating and losing what you've learned so far. Well, there's two things you said that's really important. I think one is that intention, right? We we have good intentions. And so what we like to say is that we want to make your intentions match impact, we take the good intentions and let's make sure right through this journey that we're matching. Cause yes, we are, we all have great intentions, but then we don't always pay attention to the impact that our actions have. So it really is important that we are, are doing that. When we look at the actions that we're taking, it's very important that we do pay attention there too, because it's very easy for us to look at others and say, oh my goodness, look at what this person did. Could you believe they said that? Could you believe they did that? And we like to look outward, but we don't always look inward and really ask ourselves, well, wait, what was my contribution to this? What did I do here? How could I have maybe, you know, changed this situation, made it more positive? How did I contribute? <laughs> Yeah, which goes back to our conversation about accountability again, right? And and really assuming that we always play a role in what's, what is happening. And the most probably 
effective way to solve problems in the workplace is to first look at our own contributions, as you say, because we have the most control over it, over what we do. We can't really change other people, but we can change what we are doing. And whether we take action or not, it has an impact. And so, yeah, if we change the way we approach things, things will change. Stacey, I want to ask you one final question before we move to the rapid fire questions. And it's a question about your journey. You shared turbulent childhood with some challenges. And I use this word, it was not ideal, knowing that it can be hard on kids. But also at the same time, what I do know is that these challenges that we face in life, they can be incredibly enriching. And so I wanted to ask you, having the experiences that you've had, what, how would you evaluate that? What is it that you have taken out of these experiences and how has it made you a different or perhaps a better person? It helps me to, to be more flexible. And that really is the, the key, I think, for a lot of what we talk about in our work is that flexibility is really important. We have a plan sometimes, and we want to put this plan into effect. And we get frustrated when that plan doesn't go the, exactly the way that we want it. And we keep hammering away at that plan. And it's like, no, sometimes we really have to be able to ebb and flow and, and understand where that's going to change. And so I think for me, just being in these different environments helped me to be able to be adaptable uh, and open to change and have it not hit me quite as hard as maybe some other people. I think people who moved around a lot as children in the military and things like that as well probably have a very similar outlook on life versus individuals who, you know, lived in one place all their lives and lived in one community. And it's just a difference in, in outlook. And so I am actually really thankful for that because I think it helped me in this environment. Um, and the other thing I'll say real quick, too, is just you mentioned about, you know, doing this work. I think, yes, our company is called Rework Work <laughs> because we realize that we do need to really change up what we're doing in the workplace. But I think there's also this idea that there should be an end. You know, we're doing DEI and at some point it needs to end. It's not about it being hard work. If we were a sales organization. We wouldn't say this is our sales goal and we've hit it and then, OK, now we can stop. Right. We're still we're always thriving for better. We're always thriving for more innovation. We're always looking for more creativity and for the new product and the way we can increase sales. So the same is true on, for DEI. You know, we're always looking to improve. We're constantly changing as humans. And so, yeah, what we're doing is always going to change. And I think I really even at some point think we need to stop calling it work because it isn't necessarily work. It just is part of what we do and who we are as inhabitants of this planet. I, I like this idea and would love to unpack it with you one day to, to talk about what work could be and what's the way to reframe it and the role it has in our lives. Okay, but now for now, I know I'm mindful of time. I know that um, we're running out of time. Let's um, do the rapid fire questions. And the first one is, at Culture Brain, the company that I run, we are on a mission to make work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging. And given the work that you're doing, I'm curious, what would be your number one tip to bring more of a sense of genuine belonging for people in the workplace? I think it's understanding that belonging is the flip side of inclusion. And so you can't have belonging without inclusion. And so I think it's also another thing that we strive for this concept of it, of belonging without really understanding what it is um, and that we need to take a step back and really focus on creating inclusion. Because if you create inclusion, belonging should happen. What is the sign or perhaps multiple signs that you've noticed that a company's culture uh, needs some work or perhaps even a major overhaul? Uh, I would say people don't speak up. They don't give their opinion. They don't contribute ideas because that usually means that they either no longer care or they're afraid. Do you admire any companies for the culture? Yes, actually, in my book, I mentioned Ben and Jerry's um, and it's because they're, I mentioned in the book that the frequently asked questions page answers questions like what is criminal justice reform and why would reforming cash bail be a good thing, right? 
And I think people want to say, well, do all CEOs really need to post about the things they care about as part of their company mission? And the answer is no, they don't. But it would be really good to know what CEOs care about. And I think we're in a time where we really have to take a stand and we have to draw clear lines. And most CEOs are too busy being wishy-washy, right? They're kind of following wherever the wind is blowing versus saying, no, this is who we are. This is what we stand for. This is the line. This is the side we're on over here. And not that it's about drawing sides, but it's about accountability and what we will and won't accept within our organization. And when you get very clear about what you will and won't accept, it makes it really easy for people to know who you are. Are there any books that you believe our listeners should read? And it doesn't have to be a business book, by the way. So anything really that you believe is going to help people think about cultivating a thriving culture in a different way? Well, you know, obviously I've got to plug my book. Outside of mine, you know, I've always been a fan of Marcus Buckingham. And mainly because I think my one of my favorite, and it is a business book, but my favorite is Stand Out. And it's an old book. I get it. But it really helps people to understand who they are and who they aren't. Um, and sometimes knowing who you aren't is half the battle. <laughs> and when you're trying to create culture, it is about cultivating individuals. You've got to get all the way down to the individuals. And when the individuals are unclear about who they are, it makes it really difficult for them to know if this is an organization they want to be in. And then when the organization is unclear as for, that makes it hard too. So now, now you've got two confused people trying to work together. <laughs> So true. So to wrap this all up, or maybe not to wrap this all up, but make sure that I give you an opportunity uh, to answer an important question for you. Was there something that I should have asked you, but but haven't? No, I mean, I think in this space, there's so many things we can talk about. And we talked a little bit already about like um, what individuals can do to cr start creating a culture that helps them create better teams within their organizations and really create a, a really good culture. And it really goes back to psychological safety. So I do think that is an underpinning that um, if you don't know what it is, if you aren't sure of the concept, that is um, you want a place to start is going back. You mentioned Amy Edmondson was on your podcast before. So I'd go back to that episode <laughs> and listen to what Amy has to say. I reference her work in um, our course, uh, the Unconscious Inclusion course, and we actually use psychological safety throughout that course as well to help teams to um, create psychological safety and to improve team dynamics within their organization. So that would be, I think, a, a good place to start. Stacey, and now the plug section, this is where I'd like to ask you to share the work that you are currently doing and what are the places, courses, or any other resources that you would like to send people, because I'm sure that by now they want to learn more about you, about your work, perhaps follow one of your courses. What is it that you'd like to share with our audience? Well, I mean, we have so much, um, so many resources. What I have done is uh, worked with my team to take all those resources and drop them into one place. Because before I was sending people to our LinkedIn learning, to my book, to the courses that we've created. We've created free learning pathways as well. Um, we have a newsletter that goes out weekly called Lead with Inclusion, uh, which gives a tip every week on how you can lead with inclusion. <laughs> and so it was just hard to keep all those things, you know, we're sending people everywhere. So we now have put everything together in one space. Our website is reworkwork.com. But if you go to learn.reworkwork.com, it kind of sends you directly to our portal where everything is. And I would say our signature course right now is Unconscious Inclusion, which you can find at unconsciousinclusion.com. That's the, the big thing. We're really trying to help individuals make change in organizations. And that is really where we are doubling down. And we actually worked with a neuroscientist to help us to do it. So nice. Looking forward to learn more about it. Thank you so much, Stacey, for being here with us. I really appreciate uh, your work and the change that you are leading in the world. Um, this work is much needed. And so I'm definitely going to follow you and uh, make sure that everything that you put out in the world is, uh, is something that we share with our audiences as well. One last thing that I want to ask you is who would be a great guest on this show? Do you have any recommendations for me? Yes, actually. Um, you know, it's funny. I bumped into Paul Wolf. Um, I met him many years ago when he worked at Indeed. He was the SVP of Global HR. 
And I was the keynote speaker for Payscale's uh, conference a couple of weeks ago. And he's on their board. It was just great to be reacquainted with him. And I think he would actually be a really good, uh, really good guest. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, Stacey. I'm Aga Bayer, the creator and host of the Culture Lamp podcast. And this is the Culture Lamp team. Sound producer, Heather McPherson, Twisted Spur Media. Thank you for spending your time with Stacey and me on this episode of the Culture Lab podcast. If you found this chat insightful, inspiring, or useful, and I'm guessing you did since you are still here, do me a solid, take a few seconds to share this episode and have a chat with someone about what you learned. Because when podcasts like this spark conversations and those conversations turn into actions, that's when we start making real changes in the workplace together. And if you are looking to dig deeper into these topics and connect with others who are shaping the culture within their organizations, consider joining Culture Brain. We put together a cohort of the best, most ambitious culture leaders to help them accelerate progress in their culture work. To find out more and apply, head over to tinyurl.com forward slash culture brain. The link is in the show notes. Thanks again for tuning in. If you want to get free resources on cultivating a remarkable, powerful, and authentic company culture, especially in a business that scales, type this into your browser. agabayer.com forward slash resources. If you haven't subscribed to the Culture Lab yet, please do it now. That's the best way you can support our work. And finally, we would be ever so grateful if you could rate and review our podcast on the platform that you listen to. Thank you. And you are amazing for listening to this point. Not many people do.